Apostle Peter's ministry in Acts 9, 32 through 43. And then thirdly, Gentiles receive the Holy Spirit, Acts 10, 1 through 2, 19 through 20, and 30 through 48. Our central truth today is the Holy Spirit gives power and direction for ministry. And so we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit uh, for, our, for the power that, uh, of the ministry that God has for us. Our focus today is respond to the story of the expanding early church by praying and cooperating with the Holy Spirit for the advancement of Christ's church. And our emphasis is we must depend on the Holy Spirit to convince people to believe in Jesus Christ. It's not up to me to convince them. It's up to the Holy Spirit to convince them. I'm just, gonna, I'm just the news bearer. I'm just giving you the news. I'm just giving you the message. I'm just the message bearer. But it's the Holy Spirit that convicts and convinces, and, and it's Jesus that saves. Um, and then our text this morning is, For as many are as led by the Spirit of God, they are what? They are the sons of God. So how important is it to be led? Uh, if you want to be a son or a daughter of God, uh, well, then we have to be uh, led by. And what, do you, what is a Christian? A Christian is somebody who follows Christ. Right? If you're not following Christ, then... You know, a lot of people may call themselves a Christian, but are they really, are they being led by the Spirit? Are they following Christ? And then in the NLT says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. And our, some of our, object, uh, our objectives this morning, examine how God supernaturally extended the witness of the early church and can God, uh, can God use us today? Can the Holy Spirit move today? Yes, amen. Amen. God is still, he's still on the throne. The Holy Spirit is just alive today, even if not more so today than he ever has been before. And God can use us as witnesses today in our church today, just like he did in the early church and even greater things. Um, and do we recognize our need for God's power and direction as we share the gospel today? And so... We can get caught up with all so, so many things in life that we, we fail to recognize that uh, ministries. We fail to recognize really the true calling, what God's called us to do, that there's people all around us, there's souls that are dying and going to hell, and people need the Holy Spirit. People need salvation. Um, and uh, how, do we, how, we, how do we keep our attention on the ministry, and how do we recognize our need for God's power and direction uh, continually? And then our, our third objective this morning is how can we be encouraged to uh, seek God's assistance in everything we do in witnessing for Christ? And so we, we, uh, in order to be a good witness for Christ, we need Him. We need His assistance. And so we can't do it alone by ourselves. And in our introduction this morning, as God helped the early church expand its witness for Christ, He used a variety of means and circumstances. He used persecution by unbelievers. He used desperate human need. And he used specific supernatural guidance. And the church was not merely commanded to spread the gospel. They were empowered and they were guided along the way. This guidance came from the Holy Spirit, came from the, from the Lord. Um, and how can we respond today uh, or react when, uh, you know, have you ever had an interruption in your day? <laughs> and you're, you, had your, you had your plan, you had your expectation for the day, but something happened and boom, <laughs> nothing went the way, nothing went the way that you wanted uh, from that day. And so uh, did it, how, how did you feel? Did you feel irritated, angry, uh, upset, you know, huh? frustrated? <laughs> frustrated? <laughs> so thing, these things happen, right? Uh, and... And so, and, but do we know that God has a, a plan? Does he have a purpose, right? He has a plan. He has a purpose. And boom, one day he said, I'm going to go down there and rescue my people. I'm going to get my life. I'm going to interrupt what Satan has stolen. And he, he, he put on a pair of sandals. He came in a time where there was no AC and there's no automobiles. And he said, I'm going to interrupt. Uh, this thing and I'm going to make things right. And he, he laid out his arms. He, he, uh, he 
He died on that cross and he gave his life for us. Uh, and he interrupted, he interrupted the day for us, right? Um, possibility. That, so God, he has a better plan. Most of the time, Peter, uh, people uh, do not like to be interrupted, despite the possibility of a, a positive result. However, we surrender our schedules to God. We can surprise, uh, he can surprise us with opportunities to witness for him. God can guide even the smallest details of our lives of his followers, his great plan to draw people to himself through Jesus Christ, to build his eternal kingdom is carried out uh, as believers walk closely with him and follow his leading. So it's so important that um, we're checking ourselves and saying, Lord, you know, am, uh, am I you know, here? Am I getting off track here? Am I still following you? You know, check your compass. Check, <laughs> check who's in front of you to see, make sure you're still following and you're still being led by him. This witness of Christ, the witness of the church, was uh, off to a powerful start in the city of Jerusalem. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. It had brought 3,000 to salvation. And joined later by thousands more, it just continued to spread. Yet this was only the beginning. God's plan included those who would come to Christ from outside of Israel and Judaism. Peter and uh, Philip, uh, they were privileged to be the first to bring the gospel to the Samaritans and also to the uh, Gentiles. And in Acts 8, 1 through 8, Jesus, he told his disciples that they would be his witnesses. And in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth, just as Jesus said would happen, his followers did spread the gospel through probability, not under the circumstances that they had expected. Uh, apparently uh, sparked by Stephen's death, persecution broke out like wildfire. Uh, and against the believers, suddenly Christians, they fled for their lives through Judea to Samaria and to uh, other places, taking the message of Christ with them here in Acts 8, 1 through 2. And then Philip, who along with Stephen was one of the first seven deacons ordained by uh, in Jerusalem uh, in the church there. And he preached in Samaria. And as the news of his successful evangelistic efforts uh, began to spread, the apostles, uh, Peter and John, they were sent to confirm his ministry. And the apostles, they placed their hands on the new converts in prayer. And they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They're 15, 17. You know, just praying for people. Believing that God will fill, fill them. You know, isn't it amazing that if you need prayer, if you need something, you know, you can come and ask the elders to lay hands on you and pray for you. And uh, the Lord will touch you and... And come and, and just and if all you need is just a I need a refreshing of the Holy Spirit maybe maybe you're okay you're, you got perfect health you, there's nothing wrong you got perfect finances but but your spirit is lacking you need a you need a touch of the Holy Spirit you still need somebody to come and lay your their hands on you saying Lord I need your touch touch me and fill me with your Holy Spirit so these converts in prayer they were baptized in the Holy Spirit there in verses 15 and 17 with the gospel advancing in Samaria, God called Philip to leave Samaria to minister to one man on a lonely road south of Jerusalem. And the resulting conversion became the means of the, for the gospel to be taken to Ethiopia in verses 26 and 39. And in Acts 9, 32 and 43, the Holy Spirit empowered the apostle Peter to perform miracles in the towns of Joppa and Lydia, resulting in many people putting their faith in Christ. And this was followed by the remarkable conversion of a Roman centurion, causing Peter to realize God will accept anyone who fears God and does what is right. It's time that we begin to turn our attention to Him, that we begin to fear God more than we fear man, and we begin doing the right thing. Wow, man, if we just start doing the right thing, doing what God wants us to do, man, how, what a blessing... Um, God can begin to use us. and So um, we have a little intro into this part of the lesson. I'm going to, a little video I'm going to play for you guys. Let's see if it, hopefully it, it'll play. I might have to put it on the screen there. Let's see if I can get it going here. Caesarea is known as Herod's city by the sea. Built by Herod between 20 and 10 B.C., it is located located on the northwestern coast of Israel on a major ancient Roman road. 
Cornelius, who was a centurion, usually in charge of up to 100 soldiers, of the Italian cohort, was stationed at Caesarea, which functioned as the headquarters for the Roman authority in Israel. Unlike most Roman centurions, Cornelius was a God-fearer. God-fearers were actually a Jewish religious category in the first century. They believed in the God of Israel, denounced the Roman pantheon of gods and goddesses, and went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. However, they did not go through the process of conversion, which involves circumcision for males, ritual immersion, and a temple sacrifice. An angel told Cornelius to send men to Joppa, modern-day Jaffa, the next stop on the coastal plain south of Caesarea, almost 40 miles away. As Cornelius' men reached Jaffa, Peter received a vision of a sheet with various animals he was commanded to kill and eat. Peter was confused because he was a kosher Jew and had never violated the dietary laws, yet he saw the vision three times. Some have suggested that Peter's vision has to do with kosher law, and that as a believer in Jesus, he would no longer have to follow these commandments. But the vision was much more about Jews accepting Gentiles into the kingdom of God than it was about Jewish dietary laws. The goal here was not that Jews should start eating pork, cheeseburgers, or shrimp. The vision and Peter's visit to Cornelius dealt with the acceptance of Gentiles into the newly formed believing community. Those who interpret this as having to do with eating kosher miss Peter's own words. I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. Peter's men, described as believers who are among the circumcised, were amazed when Cornelius, his household, and his men received the Holy Spirit. This amazement indicates that Peter and the people with him continued to follow the commandments. The idea that salvation did not come from the law or its observance, but rather from God's mercy, was already a Jewish opinion. Peter was simply re-emphasizing what the Jewish believer already knew. Despite the fact Jews would continue to live according to the law, the Jerusalem Council decided that there was another way for the Gentiles to stay away from idolatry, fornication, and the spilling of blood. Thus, God had defined the way how each community would relate to him, both Jews and Gentiles. But salvation was a matter of grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we go. Get back here. It's our first point here, joy in the city. So, um, uh, it's our part one here, Philip, the evangelist's ministry, Joy in the City, Acts 8, 4 through 13. I might see if Elena might have that. Acts 8, 4 through 13. Thank you. 
Okay. <clears throat> That's it. Right there. Very good. So this gospel has the power to change your life, just like it did uh, Simeon here, Simeon, and the life of everyone. Uh, anybody, it changed my life. It can change your life. Anybody that you tell or witness to, it can change their life too. Uh, Philip, he had experienced his power in Samaria, and he shared Christ, and he received God's supernatural blessing. And God and the gospel remain the same today. It's, there's nothing that changes about, has changed about the gospel. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's the same gospel then. It's the same, it has the power to change lives then. It has the power to change lives today. Those who stoned Stephen and began persecuting the church did not anticipate that the scattered believers would expect the message of Jesus Christ wherever they went. And in Acts there in 1.8, we see that uh, Jesus specifically told his followers to witness for him in Samaria among the people who for centuries had been rejected by the mainstream Jews because of their mixed race and their deviation from the proper Judaism. Jesus himself had reached out to the Samaritans in John 4, 1 through 42. Philip would share with them the full message of Christ in Acts 8 through 5. As Philip told the Samaritans about the coming of the kingdom of God and how they would, could enter into a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, God blessed Philip's preaching with miraculous signs. Uh, six um, verses there in verses 6 and 12. The experience of many as they were healed of lameness, paralysis, demon possession, brought great joy to the city there in verses 7 and 8. And also the miracles reinforced the words of Philip as the crowds fixed their attention on him. Philip's message and the miracles that accompanied it drew the people's attention away from Simon, a sorcerer who for a long time had astounded them with his magic in their 9 and 10. And verse 10 suggested that the Samaritans believed Simon's power came from God himself, which was, which was false, right? And however, Satan's lie was broken as the Samaritans believed the gospel. And even today, you know, we see, uh, we can see signs and miraculous, you know, uh, people can do can some miraculous type of things, but is it really coming from God? Is it, or is it coming from the devil? That the devil, he can work his magic too. But God, uh, we need to make sure that whatever the signs are, that the signs are coming from God, whoever we're following, again, it's following Jesus. It's who you're being led by, being led by the Holy Spirit. Make sure that you're, being, uh, that you're following Christ. Simon himself became a believer there in verse 13. Although he would later be reprimanded by the apostle Peter for attempting to purchase God's power for his own purposes. God's power, it can't be purchased. It's, it's free. <laughs> you can't buy it. You can't go out and uh, uh, really take a class and learn it or anything like that. God, he gives it to you. It's a gift from the Lord, and he, en he enables, he empowers, and uh, the gifts that he gives, he, he qualifies those gifts for, uh, for you, each individual. And uh, this, the martyrdom of Stephen was the signal for a more thorough campaign of persecution of believers. His death was not an isolated incident. It was one of, of the focal points of the tension that raged over a wide area. It was a terrible, as terrible as persecution is. You know, persecution is terrible. I, I, I pray for the people of Ukraine, people that in all those countries and the, the terror that Russia is putting on uh, nations and these people um, and persecuting. And we have, not only that, but uh, other nations and other countries and other places, even here uh, uh, where we live, there's people we face all types of persecutions and uh, but it was overruled by divine providence for the increase of the church. The scattered believers carried the gospel with them and they preached as far north as uh, uh, Syrian and Antioch. And Philip the evangelist, he became a missionary preacher to the Samaritans uh, there in verse 5. And the theme of his preaching was Christ, cr the crucified and the risen Redeemer. We have a Christ, we have a Lord, we have Jesus who died in the 
died in that grave, but on the third day he rose again. There, we, have a, we have some good news. We need to let people know that we have a Savior, Jesus Christ. He can save, he saves from sin. He came out of that grave, and so he's preaching. Philip, the word preached in the original Greek means to proclaim with authority as a herald. And so uh, we have authority this morning. When Jesus came out of the, the grave, uh, he, when we proclaim the good news, we proclaim the gospel, we stand on the word of God, uh, and when we preach, we're proclaiming with authority by the word of God uh, the truth of the gospel. The imperfect tense implies continued action, probably meaning the evangelistic campaign lasted for weeks or even months. The response to Philip's preaching was extraordinary. Verse 6 implies great crowds of people believed and gave their consent to Philip's message and appeal. The readiness with which his proclamation was accepted shows in spite of racial and religious prejudices in Samaria. Philip, he reaped where Jesus and his disciples and the woman of uh, Sikar uh, had sown some years before in John 4, 39. Philip's preaching was attested by signs which served to convince the people that his message and mission were genuine from the Lord and that the power of the living Lord Jesus um, was manifest in Philip's ministry. And um, the power, uh, his, his miracles were similar to the many cases of our Lord's healing ministry. So we see this healing, salvations, healings, uh, demon-possessed people, uh, people possessed with uh, these different things, sick people being made well. Uh, it's all these cases, of all of these circumstances, the Lord being able to have an opportunity to come in and minister and heal and touch people, but more importantly, to uh, bring salvation to people's hearts and souls and lives. The cry of the unclean spirit there in Acts 8, 7 may have been an involuntary testimony of the messiahship of Jesus and the truth of the gospel. Mark 3.11, Luke 4.41. Um, the joy among the Samaritans was inspired partly by the healing of the sick and partly by uh, Philip's preaching of the good news for the salvation of sinners who believe. In Samaria, Philip, he encountered a man of sorcery by that name of Simon, uh, Acts 8.9. And this superstitious uh, Samaritans, they were convinced Simon was on the level. His magical feats were a demonstration of the power of God. It was common then, just as it is today, for those who practice sorcery and witchcraft um, to invoke the name of God in their rituals and make you think that what they're doing is coming from God or make you think that what they're doing is some kind of a good thing. But it's not. It's coming right straight from the gates of hell. And so you better watch out. <laughs> just uh, and so Simon he saw his hold on the people weaken, and when when the gospel comes, when the good news comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, he breaks those bonds, he breaks those chains, he breaks those powers of Satan, he breaks those false things, and and uh, you know when you turn the light on in the room, you know all the cockroaches start to flee, <laughs> and, and, and so uh, we need to turn the light on, right, and break what. Uh, Get the, uh, get the light of Jesus and the gospel out there. Get Satan. Satan, he's just like a little cockroach in the middle because uh, the, the lights aren't turned on. So he's able to, to roam around and do, do all his disgusting things. Uh, but we need, to get the, we need to get the mops and the brooms and the, uh, turn the lights on and clean house. <laughs> Have a, right? We don't want bugs in our house. Simon saw his hold on the people weakened when Philip came into Samaria with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Simon himself was a Jew, or at least his name was Jewish. So he would have been all the more interested in what Philip had to say. And surprisingly, uh, Simon the sorcerer, he pretended to accept the gospel. He, he went through the motions of conversion. You know, you can go through the motions. You know, you can go through without a sincere heart. You're just there to... You're just to get the healing. You're just there to see the see the signs. If you're just here, if you're just here for the signs or the just the wonders or just the emotions, but not the relationship with Jesus Christ, and watch out. But Simon himself was a, a Jew. He he was Jewish, and uh, he would have been more all interested in what Philip had to say. 
but he, he had just pretend, he, uh, pretended to accept the gospel. And he went through those motions and, of the conversion, uh, even to be baptized there in verse 13. And the wording of the verse is uh, interesting. Simon, he continued on with Philip and watched the uh, testing signs and great miracles taking place. And apparently he studied the actions. He even began to study what they were doing uh, of Philip, trying to discover the evangelistic uh, techniques of the secrets of his trade. Later events prove Simon was not sincere there in verses 18 and 23. Um, Get on to our, our first handout here. I, might, I may actually let you guys do this one. I might just kind of skim through this. Hand those out. So if you're online, you don't get a hand, you know, you contact the church here and we try to get your hand out. If you miss, if you miss the class here, if you don't, the live class, you get to actually interact with these some of these, um, case, we have these case studies and, um, and questions and discussions. And um, this first handout here, discussion, is what happens when God heals the sick. We read in Matthew 10, 7 through 8. Let's see if I can pull that up. Uh, Matthew 10. So people can see uh, presence and power of God's kingdom today. So let's see what it has to say here. I'll, uh, it's a couple of verses, 7 and 8. Verses 7 says, Go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. Verse 8 says, what does it say? Heal, heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy, cast out demons, give as freely as as you have received. So, have, you, have you ever received a healing or has God did, done something for you? Has God touched you in any way? Um, you know, if you've been healed, then go and pray for somebody else to be healed. Pray for, you know. One great way to, uh, I found, to, if you need something from God, pray for, pray for somebody else to get something from God. And as you uh, intercede and, and pray for others, the Lord will do to you. <laughs> he'll, he'll begin to minister to you. John 6, 1 through 2. So let's see what this one has to say. This is people are attracted to the preaching of the gospel in John 6, 1 through 2. So John 6, 1 says, After this, Jesus, he crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias, and there was a crowd following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as they healed the sick. So, his healings, does that attract people? Yeah. You know, uh, I'm glad that, I'm, I'm kind of glad sometimes we don't have so much healing going on because would, people would just be more for the healing than they would. And maybe that's why God doesn't heal all the time because if he did all the time, people would just be more attracted to the healing than they would to be to him. You know, uh, but we need to make sure we're searching our hearts and that uh, that we're not that the miraculous signs is not something that we're getting our eyes on. That we're keeping our eyes on Jesus and not the signs in the of the healings. And then uh, let's go on down to this next one. Healing demonstrates the resurrection of Jesus Christ in Acts three. So um, Acts three uh, nine through sixteen. And it says um, here that all the people, they saw him walking. They heard him praising God. And when they realized he was a lame beggar, they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Peter saw his opportunity and addressed the crowd here. People of Israel, he said, what is so surprising about this and why stare at us as though we had made this man walk by our own power of godliness? It's very interesting here that, you know, Peter saw his opportunity. 
there's a message right there for those preachers. If you want to preach a message right there, you can stop right there. We can sit here and we can do a 45-minute hour, couple-day message right here of the opportunities. Uh, there's so many opportunities that, that pass us by every day, and I, I get frustrated. You know, I had an opportunity to catch a big fish yesterday, <laughs> and he got on my line, and man, he was zzz, my line was going out, and he was, and so. Uh, I was I only had six pound test line on my my fishing rod, and it was just going out. I couldn't reel the fish in, and I was hollering for the net to get the net. And um, so I began to tighten up the drag, you know, so my line wouldn't go out because I didn't want. It. And when I got to the to where, right as soon as I got to where the drag uh, would not let the line out, the fish snapped my line and it snapped. And I was so oh. I'm like, I had an opportunity there to catch a really nice fish, and I messed it up because I was playing with my drag. And that drag is there for a reason, you know, it's to help your line survive, and then you can tire the fish out. But I was, I was getting too excited. I was too anxious. Um, and so many times uh, we can miss those opportunities that God has for us because we, we try to take things in our own hands. We try to do it our way. We don't do it God's way. And so uh, we need to watch, watch those things. Uh, and then John eleven forty, healing reveals God's glory. So let's go over there, John 11, uh, 40. And this is 44. And I'm just reading through these so we can, just for the time's sake. Jesus, he responded, did not tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe. So they rolled the stone aside, and Jesus looked up to heaven, and he said, Father, thank you for hearing me. Aren't you glad that God hears us? <laughs> he has an ear, and he's listening. And so 42 says, You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all those people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. So some... So I know, isn't that amazing? He goes, God, I know you, you hear me. I know your heart. But I said it out loud so those around me can hear, hear me. You know, sometimes we need to um, do things and be, you know, there's people watching you. Uh, there's, little, there's little eyes watching you. Or there's big eyes watching you, what you do. And so uh, your life is a testimony to somebody. So healing reveals God's glory so uh, God can reveal himself and then it said here that then Jesus shouted what did he shout Lazarus come out and then uh, and the dead man came out his hands and feet uh, bound in the grave clothes his face wrapped in a head cloth Jesus told him unwrap him and let him go amen it's time that we need to unwrap unwrap all that get rid of them <laughs> let Jesus touch you and heal you and unwrap, unwrap you and let you, and, 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 and get you back on track. And here we go. The next one here is Mark two ten through twelve. Healing confirms the spoken word of God. Just walking through these. I'm taking some time in here. Two ten. And this one is. Uh, so I will prove to you. That the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. And Jesus, he turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. The man not only stood up, he jumped up, it says. It says, and the man jumped up. He grabbed his mat, and he walked out through the stunned onlookers. And they were all amazed, and they praised God, exclaiming, We've never seen anything like this before. John, and then we go over here to uh, John 11. Um, John 11, 45 uh, tells us, uh, Healing helps those who witness or experience it to have faith in Jesus Christ. Here We read in 11, 45 that many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen. But some went to the Pharisees and they told them what Jesus had done. And, and uh, 
the leading priest and the Pharisees called to the high council together, what are we going to do? Mm -mm, what are we going to do here? And they asked each other, this man certainly performs many miraculous signs. If we allow him to go on like this, soon everyone will believe in him. Then the Roman army will come and destroy both our temple and our nation. So, even in spite of all of what God's doing, He's doing He's doing good things. But we can become fearful. We we can become afraid. We can become. But we need to uh, help and offer encouragement to each other to continue uh, to having faith in Christ. Right in here. So, and not to listen to those around us. So what was the? Even if it came from the high council, we could uh, go back, going back to forty-seven. There, that question there: What are we going to do? I can ask you that question today. What are you going to do? What are you going to do with your faith in Jesus today? And so, are you going to be afraid? <laughs> are you going to take up your cross? What are you going to do? Uh, uh, he has healing for you. He has forgiveness for you. He has salvation. He has the power. He has power. He has everything you need is in him. But why are we so afraid to accept, accept him into our life? Why are we so afraid? What, what's causing us to uh, not take that step toward him? And then we go to Luke 8, 1 through 3. Healing promotes discipleship uh, there in Luke uh, 8. Uh, one through three. I'm not going to go through all of these, but soon afterward, Jesus uh, he began a tour of the nearby towns and villages, preaching and announcing the good news and the kingdom of God. He took his twelve disciples with him. I always say right here, uh, you, you know, if, if, if Jesus needed twelve guys around him, how much more important is it is that we need uh, some disciples around us? If Jesus, the Son of God had people around him, you know. And here he is. He goes, what does it say here? It says he took his 12 disciples with him. We need to be taking uh, folks with us when we go places and when we do ministry together. We need to have, be in the, we're in this thing together. Um, and so 8-2 here, uh, along with some women, he had healed and from whom he had cast out evil spirits. So, among them were Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. Uh, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's business manager, Susanna, and many others who were contributing to their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. And then, uh, so that, that's it right there on that one. Healing promotes discipleship. So uh, it's true healing. Healing's coming from God. True ministries going forth, true, true discipleship will take place. And so um, I know I spent a little bit, a, little, a lot of time on that handout. Requirement for revival, Ray, um, um, here, Ray H. Hughes, he said, Any church that is not willing to accept pointed, passionate preaching can never expect to have a soul-searching revival. We need revival. We heard that last week, I think, in the class. Somebody mentioned one of the things that we need is a revival. Revival cannot come when the church winks at sin and becomes tolerant with sin. Sin cannot be pondered or galvanized or whitewashed. It must be exposed. And so, and here, here again, the, the magicians of the world, the deceivers of the world are saying oh you need to be tolerant you need to be tolerant of us you know but the thing is, is the world's not tolerant of us of the Christians they don't it's a they don't know how to be tolerant but they want they want to, they want us to tolerate the sin they want they want to, they want their sin but they don't want to uh, do the right thing they don't want to live for God and repent of the sin so and then here we have uh, going to our next point here Joy in the desert is Acts 8, 26 through 40. Do you know that you can have 
uh, you may be in a desert place today. You may be in a place where it's dry. You're not <laughs> not much water, and it's hot. Here we're experiencing this hot Texas heat, 100 in the 110 degree, 108 degree weather all this week. Um, you may feel like you're in a desert place, but God, He can come into wherever you're at, and He can bring an oasis. He can He can bring uh, water, peace, and rain to you. Uh, in your desert place today if you reach out to him. And here in 826, this is uh, Acts. Let's see if I can pull it up here. <clears throat> it says, As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, Go south, down to the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. Here he's telling him to go to this desert road. <laughs> what, Lord, you want me to go to the desert? I thought you wanted me to go to Hawaii or somewhere, you know, somewhere nice out on the beach somewhere. No, I want you to go to this desert. So he started out and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, eunuch, great authority under the Kandake, the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship. He was now returning, seated in his carriage. He was reading out loud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. And the Holy Spirit said to him, Go over and walk along beside the carriage. And Philip, he ran over and he heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. And Philip asked, Do you understand what you're reading? The man replied, How can I unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. The passage of scripture he had been reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So beginning... With the same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. You know, we have good news that we have. that we, When those opportunities come up and God positions us, even in the desert, wherever God sends us to be, uh, that we can share some, some good news with somebody uh, at the right time, at the right place. You know, God's, God's timing is always on time. It's always where we need to be. Isn't that amazing? When You know it's God because He's always... He's always positioned it right there, right on time. He's never too early. He's never too late. He's always right there on time. I don't know how he does it. It, it blows my mind. <laughs> uh, he, right down to the minute, it can be what God is. And so in 36 here it says, And as they rode along, they came to the, some water. And the eunuch said, Look, there's some water. Why can't I get baptized right now? Well, there just happens to be some. We're in a desert. And the Lord just touched my life, and I want to get baptized, and the Lord provided some water right there. Wow, what timing. Wow. And, um, and if, you, if you're out there today, and, and maybe you've recently uh, given your life to the Lord, and you want to be baptized, contact the church. We'll, we'll baptize you. Uh, I was working with a guy at work uh, several years ago, and uh, shared Christ with him, and he gave his heart to the Lord, and he called me back and said, Glenn, I need to be baptized. <laughs> and so we, uh, uh, Eddie was his name. And so we, uh, I said, okay, I'm gonna, we'll go to the church and we'll uh, get the baptistry all ready for you and we'll baptize you next Sunday. He goes, great, let's, let's do it. So we, we didn't have any heat or anything. The water was cold. And so we filled up the baptistry and we baptized Eddie. Uh, he wanted to be baptized. And so, and we had a baptistry. We had, we had a place. There just happened to be a place there uh, that we could do that, where we were at that time. God provides. Uh, and so, uh, let's go on with our lesson here. Uh, this next handout here is um, Isaiah saw Christ. I'm just going to, we've only got about 10 minutes in this lesson left. I'm just going to kind of skim through this one as well. Uh, 
So Philip, he used Isaiah 53 as a starting point for his gospel presentation to the Ethiopian eunuch, written about 700 years before Christ. The chapter is an important prophecy of the saving work of the Messiah. So here in Isaiah 53, uh, identify what Philip may have told the eunuch with the following references to Jesus' life and saving work as seen in the four Gospels. And in references to teaching the New Testament epistles about Jesus' life and the saving work. So, we'll, so let's pull these up here. Um, Isaiah 53, 1 through 3. You can turn there if you have your Bible. Or I'll pull it up here on the, the screen here. And we'll go through these a little quicker for time's sake. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in the dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. 53.4, uh, 6 says, Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. We thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for our own sins. He was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away we have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. And, and 53.8 says, Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. And then, so, are you all, are you seeing all these references here? How, are you seeing Christ in here? <laughs> you can go on and on here. So, I'm just going to go on down here to verse, to ver the, verse 12 here for time's sake. Verse 12 says, I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. He's our intercessor today. Amen. He intercedes for us today. So, y'all have any, if there's any questions or anything, y'all have any comments, just let me know. So I'm, I'm trying to get through a, a bunch of this through this lesson. I don't want to go too fast, but I don't want to go so slow that <laughs> try to get through some of this information. The Apostle Peter's ministry healed as a witness here in part two, Acts 9, 32 through 35. Uh, let me see here. Let's go ahead and read that one. I'm just going to go right to the word here. Acts 9, 32 through 35. <clears throat> so we're talking about healed as a witness. 932 says, Meanwhile, Peter, he traveled from place to place, and he came down to visit the believers in the town of Lydia, or Lydda. And there he met a man named uh, Nias, who had been paralyzed and bedridden for eight years. Peter said to him, Ananias, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up. Roll up your sleeping mat. And he said, and he was healed instantly. Then the whole population of Lydda and Sharon saw Ananias walking around and they turned to the Lord. Good morning, good morning. Welcome. Amen. 
Okay. We'll go on here to our next point. Raised as a witness in nine, Acts 9, 36 through 43. So we'll keep on reading down, down here. 9, 36. It says, There was a believer in Joppa named Tabitha, which is, a, which is Greek, is Dorcas. She was uh, doing kind things for others and helping the poor. And about this time, she became ill and she died. Her body was washed uh, for burial and laid in an upstairs room. But the believers uh, had heard that Peter was nearby at Lydda. So they sent two men to beg him, please come as soon as possible. And so uh, Peter, he returned with them. And as soon as he arrived, they took him up to the upstairs room. The room was filled with windows who were weeping, widows who were weeping and showing him the coats and other clothes Dorcas had made for them. But Peter asked them all to leave the room. He, then he knelt and he prayed. And he, turning to the body, he said, Get up, Tabitha. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. In 41, he gave her his hand and he helped her up. Then he called in the widows and all the believers and he presented her to them alive. And then 42, the news spread through the whole town and many believed in the Lord. And Peter stayed a long time in Joppa, living with Simon, the tanner of, of hides. So, how do we, we can ask, we have a question here, how do you respond uh, in these situations of uh, to life or death, when believers turned to him after the ultimate death of a friend, Peter, he knew what to do. Uh, he didn't. He didn't accept the death, right? He went in there, and he's he he knew enough of God that he knew that he could pray and 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 ask the Lord to bring her back to the life, and God did. And so, and many times we just kind of we have an impossible situation that we sometimes run into, and we just assume, oh, it's just we don't even think about asking God to heal in that situation but we have we can we have the opportunity to do that we need to take advantage of that and so when when things come up in life give it to God and see what God can do right yeah. so uh, that's that's a lesson there that we can learn even though that may be a, a situation that just seems impossible pray and ask God and see what God will do in that situation this uh, wonder working love <clears throat> here pull it up wonder working love and the hero within in 1904 and 1905 the Holy Spirit moved in power in the British Isles during the famous Welsh revival in the short span of two years over 150,000 souls came to Christ the theme song of their great revival was uh, a Welsh hymn that God's about God's love its lyrics spun the tale of our Father's love for His children as few lyrics before or since could, ever could. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the Prince of Life, my ransom, shed for me His precious blood, who His love will not remember, who can cease to sing His praise. He shall never be forgotten, through heaven's everlasting days. And so what an amazing song that, you know, um, in circumstances of life and tragedies of life and uh, even when God comes in and he does a miraculous thing, he heals, he touches songs. People write songs about those experiences. You know, we have amazing, great, we have all these songs in, that we have in our hymn books that came from uh, God doing something or healing somebody. And then, um, and this, uh, the blessings of obedience, Adrian Rogers, he wrote, you cannot obey God without your obedience spilling on in a blessing to all those around you. And so when God's blessings are in you, it will flow out of you and, and to all those around you. Isn't that amazing? And, it's, and that's the Holy Spirit, the gospel spreads through you. So in this uh, last point, or this next point here, I'm just going to talk about it because we don't have time to go through it. 
but this is uh, and invite you guys to you can do these finish this at home or uh, read through these these lessons at home uh, what we did we didn't cover today but here the Gentiles they received the Holy Spirit they accepted from all nations so here we have the Holy Spirit being poured out accepted this is this is the this is the part we really don't want to stop on this is the part we really want to get get going and moving on we could spend this is the exciting part here this end of the le it's actually the beginning of the lesson <laughs> even though we're having to end it here this morning but the spirit filled with evidence here in Acts 10:39 the holy spirit comes in you know it was in that upper room that Peter he went and he prayed for that Tabitha right and it was in that upper room that they waited and they tarried for the Holy Spirit to come uh, to fill them. And so uh, we might ask that question today. Do you have an upper room today? Do you have an upper room that you can go to and that you can tarry and you can ask for God to, and, and wait for the Lord to come and fill you uh, with his presence and with his power, with what he's going to do? And so, and then moving on, this last handout here, uh, I'll let you guys... Do this one at home. Why should you be baptized? Is a good is a is a good uh, study here on this little handout. Why should you be baptized? If you have that question, you know why should I get baptized? Uh, go. There's some questions here, and, and, and you can go through. Um, and then in our conclusion to this today's lesson, since we're right here at the last couple of minutes of the lesson, uh, is unite and receive. Whenever God can get a people that will come together in one accord and in one mind in the word of God the baptism of the Holy Spirit will fall upon them like as at Cornelius' house you know if we can just get in one mind if we can just get in one accord and if we can just wait on the Lord do his will and man just give the Holy Spirit a chance to do what he's going to do and he will he's a gentleman he doesn't force himself on us he doesn't make us uh, serve him but we, uh, when we uh, invite him and we wait on him, that he does his mighty things. God, he worked through Philip by witnessing to an individual on a remote road as surely as he had worked through him to touch the crowds in Samaria. He worked through Peter as he brought the healing and the life to individuals in Lydia and Joppa. And as he brought the gospel to an entire Gentile and a household of Caesarea. God's priority of bringing grace into people's lives remains the same. Whether to uh, one person or to a crowd, he used the Apostle Peter, the Deacon Philip. He will use every believer who uh, opens himself or him uh, herself to his power and direction. If God can use me, he can use you. And if you just allow him to use you in your life. And so, um, and in some of our challenges this week, um, you know, look for ways to spend time with family and friends who have never heard the gospel. You might, I'm sure, we all know somebody who's not a Christian, who has a, uh, whose life is not right with the gospel. And then the challenge is, you know, how can I share some gospel with them? How can I share some good news with them? How can I share the gospel? And so, how can I uh, find ways to do that? And then a second challenge here is make time daily to listen for the voice of God and to open yourself to his specific direction, you know. And my day's so busy, I don't know how to <laughs> organize my time. But how do we do that? How can we, how, how can we find that, that five minutes or that ten minutes or that time in the morning or in the afternoon or whenever to make time to listen for the voice of God? You know, it can get so noisy sometimes. We need to just quiet down so we can listen. For, him, for his voice, right? And so um, get that noise out so we can hear. And then another challenge, our uh, last challenge here is examine your heart for any prejudices that may keep you from sharing the gospel. You know, sometimes uh, it's those prejudices that can get in our way and block us from uh, sharing some really good news for somebody that somebody needs salvation, you know? Uh, so we just need to get those things out of the way so that we can touch somebody's lives that, that needs it. And so, and then uh, on the end of our, on our handout, we have our daily devotions. If you have a devotional that you're going through, if not, you can go through the devotions of this class here, and it kind of goes right along with the, the lessons that we're doing. 
And so, and that's pretty much the conclusion of our class. Is there anybody that has anything you want to pray about? We're going to continue to pray for those that are traveling. We've got a lot of people that are traveling. Wilson's uh, traveling. Hopefully, Wilson and Vicki will be back next week. We have Edward. He's out uh, this week and I think next week. My dad's been out. Hope my dad should be back next week. Uh, we back Wednesday, yeah. So yeah, Wednesday, my dad's uh, he's going to be teaching here Wednesday. So uh, be here Wednesday for the prophecy teaching. If you want to hear some good prophecy teaching from Dr. Uh, G. L. Cook, he'll be here Wednesday uh, at seven o'clock here at the church teaching. So come. Uh, it's going to be good because he's. He's gotten some rest now, and he's been able to be at home a little bit. And so he's, he told me, make sure you tell the church I'm going to be there uh, Tuesday because he's, he's got a good message to bring Tuesday. So, Wednesday. I mean Wednesday. Sure. Wednesday, I'm sorry. I don't know what day I'm on. <laughs> so uh, who else? What else do we need to pray for? Uh, let's pray for Robert this morning. I want to pray for Robert. Uh, and so good morning, good morning. Welcome. Okay, so we're concluding our class. I'm going to go ahead and pray. Anything else? Y'all have it? Okay. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity of our class today, Lord. We just pray for all those that are traveling today, Lord God, those that have, are sick. God, we just pray for a touch for those that are, are not feeling well today and those that are in recovery today, Lord, uh, from in this class, Lord. And, those that are online, those that are coming for service this morning, we just pray your hand of protection on traveling mercies, Lord God. Lord, we just thank you for your word this morning that uh, we can just be uh, your witness. We just pray that the Holy Spirit, Lord God, would just lead us and guide us and have, have your way within our hearts, Lord God, that we can just continue to uh, let you use us for your glory and your power. We just give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you all. We'll see you next week.